In April 1994, Kurt Cobain, the lead singer of Nirvana, tragically died at his Lake Washington home in Seattle. He left behind one of the most important legacies in modern music. Among Nirvana's three studio albums, the third and final, In Utero, has attracted the most controversy. It really did spark something quite significant in millions and millions and millions of people, and no rock musician, no artist can ask to accomplish any more than that. essentially is a you know is a flip middle finger to everybody who accused them of being you know pop sellouts they made rock look sound and act like it should do again having been seen as everything from an artistic high to a protracted suicide note this film examines in utero how it came into existence the music itself and the band that made it that would become Nirvana formed in the isolated logging town of Aberdeen in the Pacific Northwest of America. Aberdeen is a pretty much end of the world kind of place. It's, it's on the rainfall map of Washington State. Seattle is, is kind of obscured by hatch marks, but uh, Aberdeen is black. I mean, it is where rain lives. One of the interesting things about Aberdeen is it's one of the only cities on the west coast of America that has actually lost population over the last 50, 100 years. Um, at the turn of the century, it was a booming town, and it was booming because primarily uh, the fishing industry was big, the logging industry, and the natural resources. It's a dying fishing town, a, a seaside town, and it's a really dying lumber town, so you had a population there that was basically uh, depressed economically and psychologically. The first incarnation of Nirvana came together in Aberdeen during the mid-1980s. The band was centered around bassist Chris Novoselic and guitarist and singer Kurt Cobain. Forming around a mutual love of punk rock, one of the group's earliest influences was another Aberdeen punk band, the Melvins. Kurt was uh, really influenced by the Melvins, and for good reason. I mean, they, they were just, they were the heaviest thing there was. There wasn't anything heavier than the Melvins, and there probably still isn't anything heavier than the Melvins today. Melvins were another band out of Aberdeen that actually broke out prior to Nirvana. I had heard of them first, uh, before Nirvana ever showed up, and they had put out a slew of records, and uh, they were unique. I mean, here was a band who had, to quote the old Frank Zappa phrase, no commercial potential. They showed these younger bands that you could not compromise your music, that you could play it as sludgy, as grungily, as loud, as nasty as you wanted. They played a major role artistically. The Melvins were just a pure band in what they did. They did not kowtow to what was successful. They had a vision and they stuck with it and they're still sticking with it. But that purity of artistic form was extremely important to 
Kurt's own vision of himself later. Despite the impact of the Melvins and other contemporary punk bands on Nirvana's early development, mainstream American rock was dominated by their complete antithesis. Something had died of rock in, in the mid-80s. It really became the music of pizza houses and supermarkets, and the sound of it reflected that. You know, you found that your parents were liking rock bands more than you were. Before Nirvana, you had a much clearer, and now seems unbelievably clear, divide in American rock between what was mainstream and what was underground. And the mainstream was kind of poodle hair metal. People were just fed up with what we were hearing on the radio all the time. You know, we were really tired of listening to, uh, you know, a lot of the 80s rock and L.A. rock, rock scene going on, and because um, it was so, it was so campy. You know, it wasn't honest. It was just like built to make a buck. Before Nirvana existed, uh, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of people in America had no idea that there was such a thing as an American underground rock. By the time Kurt Cobain moved to the college town of Olympia, this underground rock scene was becoming a major influence on his songwriting. Well, one thing about Kurt is that he was definitely obsessed with music. I mean, like us all, like the, the group of friends that we hung out with, music, obsession with music was the, the thing that we had in common. And he was always buying new records, going out to see new bands, talking about, you know, reading books about the lives of bands and, um, talking about music all the time. We both enjoyed listening to the Melvins. We both actually liked older bands like Led Zeppelin, you know, Pink Floyd, uh, newer bands, Flipper. Um, as a, he really liked Mud Honey a lot. I did too, that whole scene that started going on, Screaming Trees in Seattle. Um, I liked X a lot, I think he did too. This was just like a lot of different punk bands. Black Flag, we both really into Black Flag. $35 and I took back to my day. Send the rest of me, so who's the play? Sick, bad, they say I'm fucked up all the time. Sick, bad, what they do so waste of my time. Sick, bad, Black Flag were pretty important. Um, Henry Rollins, of course, uh, was their lead singer for quite a while. And um, they were, I think, in many ways, they were kind of a blueprint for what the grunge bands did. It's just the difference is the grunge bands ultimately ended up selling millions of records. I know it'll be okay. But I gotta fix my kidney. That's right. Hey! The basic history was that you had hardcore punk in America, which was like a cult sort of hardcore punk, had that kind of intensity about it as a movement, and that was basically the beginning of Nirvana, and it was an underground network of small clubs, fanzines, all across the country, basically formed around people following Black Flag and Minor Threat were the two essential bands, and that was the kind of hardcore punk establishment, and then you had the sort of art overlay which came from people like Sonic Youth. bunch of bands uh, who looked at the American punk rock scene, uh, who loved it, who loved its commitment, loved its attitude, but perhaps thought musically it wasn't ambitious enough. 
So you saw people like Sonic Youth who um, you know, borrowed, borrowed a lot of the imagery, a lot of the sound from those bands, but then would add a kind of more arty level. They were more interested in musical experimentation. Uh, you know, they weren't going to be stuck with the same three chords. They would uh, you know, experiment with, with feedback and other things that were actually you know, sounded fairly radical at the time. And uh, those groups also actually developed a fairly uh, coherent pop sensibility. If you think of a band like the Pixies, um, who many people think probably should have been as big as Nirvana, uh, but just came along a bit too early for that to happen. Um, the thing about the Pixies is they were, on one level, an absolutely terrifying uh, hard rock band. You know, they made a you know, horrible noise, they had horrible lyrics about horrible things. But, on another level, they had fantastic pop melodies. And when you put those two elements together, you really did come up with something quite unique. It's always been generally assumed that the Pixies were the most important influence on Nirvana because of the, the kind of, the, put it simply, the quite loud dynamic. I had a real key grasp of dynamics, which was um, to prove incredibly influential on, on the grunge scene. I think people boil it down to, you know, quiet bit, loud bit. Um, there was a bit more to it than that in both Nirvana's hands and the Pixies' hands, but um, you know that, that if you want to be simplistic about it, that is what it was about. But it's the contrast that made those those bands so startling. All we ever talked about was what bands we were into and playing records for each other and, you know, buying records and going out to see bands. And, you know, we were all, a, it was a group of people who were extremely obsessed with music. While Kurt was still living in Olympia, Nirvana was signed to Seattle-based label Sub Pop Records. Despite the small size of the label, Nirvana were able to convince them to release their first LP, Bleach. But it wasn't a record that was going to change the world. It was just a good underground rock record of the time. You, I didn't really have an inkling that Nirvana were going to burst open and, and change, alter the rock landscape, you know, as we knew it within a year. However, it did do well enough to attract the attention of one of the major labels, Geffen Records. Recruiting Dave Grohl on drums, Nirvana went into the studio to record what would become Nevermind. No, in all the time I met, I knew Kurt, he never ever talked about having ambition to be a rock star. He never predicted that he was going to be a big rock star. Smells Like Teen Spirit, in my opinion, the reason that that song is so powerful is that the lyrics, the sound, the whole emotional tone of that song is so instantaneous and so connecting to every human. Before Kurt even sings in that song, you know what the song's about. I mean, those, those early, those first few notes in that tune, to me, you know, reach to my own sense of alienation and abandonment. Most rock and roll anthems and Smells Like Teen Spirit was nothing if not a rock and roll anthem, but most rock and roll anthems are, they tend to be sort of exhortations to, you know, revolt or rebel, and Smells Like Teen Spirit was, uh, it was about withdrawal, really. It was, I mean, the, 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 the key Kurt Cobain lyric is, oh, well, whatever, never mind.
The huge commercial success of Nevermind and Smells Like Teen Spirit turned Nirvana into overnight stars. This level of unprecedented fame took its toll on the band members and their punk rock philosophy. Well, Nirvana took off faster than anyone was prepared for. Um, certainly Kurt wasn't prepared for that success, nor was Chris, nor was, was Dave. Um, these guys had been in sort of struggling bands that had driven around the country in vans. And Nevermind was selling so fast in the fall of 1991 that there literally were shortage of it of the record. You couldn't find it for about two weeks because it had sold out everywhere. They just put out their first major label album, their second album, Total, Nevermind, which had sold an absolutely staggering quantity in very little time, which is something that nobody had expected or anticipated. Uh, they'd reacted to that sort of onrush and fame and success, it's fair to say, pretty badly. This discomfort with their commercial success was further compounded by the unravelling of Cobain's personal life. Increasingly, the band were becoming uncomfortable with their celebrity status and with the album that had garnered them their success. We got a lot of attention, you know what I mean? A lot of, like, teen spirit was kind of played into the ground, kind of made me feel a little self-conscious, you know. Um, what do you guys think of Hysteria? Oh, it's a load of shit. You know, Nevermind was produced and recorded as a pop record by a rock band. And, you know, sounds like it. It, it obviously worked. <laughs> you know, it did what it's supposed to do. It made the band uh, radio staples. Uh, you know, the songs were very well recorded and very well produced pop tunes. But, um, you know, and I think the band, to some extent, felt that it didn't really capture what Nirvana was really all about, which was something a little more raw. He was genuinely troubled by the kind of the commercial success that Nirvana had, mainly because he felt that now the vast majority of his listeners were the sort of people he hated, you know, sort of jocks and frat boys, the kind of people that probably made his life in misery at high school, you know, and these sort of um, bandwagon hoppers and all these kind of people he hated. And he wanted to get rid of what he saw as that kind of superfluous element of his... Um, fan base. They hadn't expected to sell millions of records. They certainly hadn't expected to be this, become this kind of pop band. And uh, that worried um, Cobain in particular, I think. He thought somehow that he himself had sold out without even trying. And uh, they came from a scene which was underground in nature and underground in attitude. Um, and they, if perhaps another band had done that, they'd have been the people saying, oh, those guys sold out, you know, they sold out to MTV. So they put themselves in that position. And when they came to thinking about making the follow-up, um, I mean, in utero essentially is a, you know, is a flip middle finger to everybody who accused them of being, you know, pop sellouts. I have a feeling with the next record, we're gonna lose a lot of our audience. Against this backdrop of commercial pressure and punk rock authenticity, Nirvana quickly began writing and recording a more raw and aggressive album. It was this record that would eventually be called In Utero. Among the first demo time booked for the new album was a session at the end of 1992 with Bleach producer Jack Endino. The demoing, well, of course, I didn't know that it was going to be called In Utero. Nobody knew yet because it was a year and a half you know, away. This was in, I think, I think it was September of 1992. Uh, they called me up, and this was right about the time that Francis was born, Francis Bean. Um, they called me up, they booked the time, and then they canceled at the last minute because the baby had just been born. And then a few weeks later, they, they rescheduled. Um, and they actually, Dave and Chris showed up along with a couple of their sort of roadies, technicians, whatever. And they set up and then Kurt didn't show up. The second day, he finally showed up in the evening and they bashed out six songs instrumentally, very quickly. And then uh, Kurt sang on one of them, which was Rape Me. Dave 
was so loud that we had a noise complaint at the studio, which was the first time we had had a noise complaint in five years at that building. And it was from a neighbor that was like several houses away because the police came and much to my amazement, the police came and knocked on the door and you know, I had to say, well, I'm recording Nirvana in here. And they said, well, we don't you know, care who you're recording. There's this guy through, you know, down the street and they pointed at a house. He's complaining about the noise and I'm thinking, wow, I guess Dave is pretty loud. So um, you know, fortunately we were about finished by then and, and we just went ahead and did the last song and that was the end of that. Once they actually were playing, it was pretty easy, pretty routine. They just went through the songs. Uh, it's just too bad Kurt didn't bother to sing on any of them because I didn't really get to hear what the, I didn't really get to hear them as songs until the In Utero record came out. You know, years later, I was like, oh, that's how that song goes. You know, because I didn't hear, the, you know, no lyrics, no melodies, just some guitar riffing and, and you know, drumming. So, so it was a pretty inconclusive session. By 1993, Nirvana were ready to record the new album. Their search for punk rock authenticity had led them to Steve Albini, both a respected recording engineer and controversial musician in his own right. The decision to go with Albini was, was sort of presented as being about the Albini sound, but it was actually about much more than that. It was actually a sort of complete ideological package and a way for Nirvana to say, you know, look, we might have made it, but we're still true to where we're coming from. I mean, now Albini, it, what's most often tends to mention, of course, that he'd produced the Pixies, who were Nirvana's favourites, and, you know, that's kind of a straight thing. But more importantly, Albini had been a key figure in kind of taking on the legacy of hardcore punk kind of exploded in about the mid-'80s. During the early 1980s, Albini had formed an influential and inflammatory punk band, which went by the moniker of Big Black. It's like Big Black, you know, the, the, the guitar sound is huge, you know, they've got the, you know, these massive sort of open sluices of sort of jet black sound that are coming out. It's a sound that's got a very kind of punkish attitude, but at the same time it's like harking back to, unashamedly, to the sort of massive sounds that you get with people like Led Zeppelin and, and Black Sabbath. So they're one of an, like a number of bands who are kind of almost like kind of, you know, in rock sort of supposedly, you know, latter years, they're kind of suddenly um, massively sort of extending its kind of, you know, its lexicon, its vocabulary and sort of raising the sort of volume and temperature of rock music the way that Hendrix had done maybe 20 odd years earlier. Despite other musical projects, including the extremely controversial Rape Man and more artistically successful Shellac, Albini moved into record production, applying the same philosophy of creative simplicity to the recording process as he did to his own music. Albini has attracted the likes of the Pixies, P.J. Harvey, Godspeed You Black Emperor, and more recently, Will Oldham, to his Chicago studio. Steve Albini is, is a no-nonsense producer, almost to the point of caricature. He does produce all sorts of different sorts of music, which is often forgotten about him, and he has in his time. I mean, he even made a country record with Robbie Falks once. But he does bring a very similar sensibility to everything he does, which is there's, there's no frippery, there's no frills, everything is done as sparsely and as simply as it can be. And he has a very rigidly anti-commercial ethos, which is not to say that he is, uh, he's against making records that people might actually like and people will want to buy, but he's very, very careful to guard against any hint that that's why he's making the music, to the extent that he has as far as I'm aware, career-long uh, policy of never accepting royalties for work on his record. He takes a flat fee. Uh, I'm sure in the case of a band like Nirvana with Geffen's backing, backing it's not an inconsiderable flat fee, but he doesn't take... Um, it, it makes no difference to him financially whether the record he's made sells 100 copies or 100 million copies. The key element of the Albini package was that you go to his studio, you make the record in two weeks, do the whole thing, and it's, he's not credited as the producer because he regards that as a you know, decadent pre-punk indulgence. It's recorded by Steve Albini. 
With Steve Albini on board, Nirvana entered the studio in February 1993 and quickly completed the album in half the time it had taken to record Nevermind. However, despite the smooth recording process, there were to be some complications over the record's final mix. So they did this record, by all accounts, it went quite well, everyone was happy with it. And then, uh, almost as soon as it was finished, Albini as a kind of preemptive strike sort of said, you know, well, I bet the label aren't going to like this. And as soon as Kurt played it to the label, of course, the, the aspect about it the label didn't like, which is that it's a characteristic of Albini's productions that the vocals are quite low down. It sometimes sounds... There's there's, it, it's a weird mixture of kind of clarity and sludginess you get with him. Like, you can hear some aspects of the band very clearly, and there's something else. Sometimes you listen to his production, you think, now I understand why people take some months to make an album. And, it, you know, it seems that those two things were both apparent in these recordings, because when they got them home... Uh, various members of Lana sort of listened to them and thought there were things, that most of it they liked, but there were things they didn't like. And then this huge, ridiculously political round blew up where the Varney, um, Albini as a kind of preemptive strike said, well, I bet the record company are going to change it. Then there were sort of stories in Newsweek. It just got completely out of hand and became this... Uh, basically, when you look back at it now, the idea of, in American pop music of an ideological debate about how a noisy rock album should be made, occupying the very centre of the media. I mean, it's just, if you think of it now, it's completely ridiculous. But it did happen, and it was, and it was kind of fun. And, and the record, when it appeared, it did bear out... It, it bore out sort of both sides of the argument. In, in the end, after sort of threatening to get the whole thing re-recorded and then deciding not to, Nirvana ended up just... I think they got R.E.M.'s producer, Scott Litt, to kind of tidy up a couple of tracks, which, was for a record that was done in just a couple of weeks, was really very minor. By the end of the summer of 1993, In Utero was finally ready to be released. The first song to be heard from the new record was the single Heart-Shaped Box. Heartshade Boss is, is really Kurt Cobain's songwriting genius, you know, kind of distilled into one song. I really do think that if there's one song that stands up as a definitive Nirvana song, it's this one, even more than Smells Like Teen Spirit. It's, uh, it, it, it has all the great Nirvana tropes there. It does the loud, quiet, loud bit, which is, as Kurt Cobain freely admitted, something of a borrow from the Pixies. Um, it, it, it goes in and out of sort of two or three different movement, movements. It has these fantastically violent, abrasive guitars and yet an incredibly sweet tune over the top of it. Listen to the song, it seems so obvious that it's about Courtney, the kind of the great love story and hate story that was at the heart of everything Nirvana seemed to be doing at that stage. There's a lot of images of sort of him being, uh, you know, being trapped inside this box, and it's quite a kind of nightmarish image of dependency on someone else. And the whole thing, you know, it is, it's kind of like, you know, it's like this little thing and you, you, you take the lid off and there's all sorts of stuff in there, some of which you'd want to look at and some of which you wouldn't. So, you know, I think in the end, that ends up being one of Nirvana's more fascinating songs. It's very, very hard to say what it's about. I suspect it's not actually about a heart-shaped box. Um, there's a certain amount of Cobain's stereotypical self-mockery in that line in the chorus about, you know, wait, I've got a new complaint. He was, he was aware, I think quite hyperactively aware of the perception of himself and indeed of a lot of the Seattle bands as a whole as a collection of uh, overindulged, spoilt middle-class whiners who didn't really have anything to complain about. When it was released as a single, I think it was probably was a surprise to a lot of people. Everyone was expecting Nirvana to come back with a, you know, another fist-punching rock anthem in the, in the Smells Like Teen Spirit mode, and Heart Shed Box wasn't really that. But uh, again, it was one of those songs that made people think, you know, realise that there was, there was more to Nirvana and Kurt Cobain than that type of song, and perhaps realised that here actually was a, you know, a 
a, a really serious and, and sensitive artist. In Utero was released on September the 21st, 1993. Despite all the anticipation surrounding the record's release, the title alone caused some controversy. I think that the title In Utero is a great title. And before that was finally decided on, I think it was going to be called I Hate Myself and I Want to Die, which was what Kurt used to say, basically, if anyone asked him how he was. He got so fed up of people asking how he was, he would always say, I hate myself and I want to die. And obviously, history has given a, a tragic extra layer of relevance to that statement. But it was kind of one of those things they did that was meant as a joke and was a way of kind of coping with how ridiculous their life had become. I think the next title, another title I had was Verse, Chorus, Verse, which was sort of sarcastic summation of classic pop songwriting, which you know, he knew he could do by then. In utero may, on the face of it, be a more palatable um, you know, title, but I think really it's clear that Kirk Cobain is really saying, he, you know, basically he wants to go back to a time before he was born. Um, the artwork is, is fairly disturbing, it's pretty macabre, um, and you know when you when you see that in a record shop, even today, it does stand out as a different kind of sleeve. Never mind, had a very celebrated sleeve, but essentially it was a kind of cartoony image that everybody got. This was something very different. The first song on In Utero, Serve the Servants, starts with an extremely self-aware opening statement. <laughs> opens with that you know, fantastic couplet of somewhat sledgehammer sarcasm from Kurt Cobain saying teenage angsters paid off well now I'm bored and old. Uh, he would have been I guess 26 when he wrote that. Um, but yeah it is, it's, it's basically, it does set the tone for the album. It's, it's you know, I've got everything I wanted and, and I don't want it. The fact is, it's obviously meant to be a joke. He's saying, this is, this is the start of my first album after a huge successful album. I'm just going to put that there. And he said, you know, that was just a little throwaway line just to introduce, because I knew that everyone was thinking that anyway. So I thought if I could say it, it could clear some space. You put uh, In Utero on and then you're expecting, <laughs> you're really expecting a, a racket. And Cobain plays with that, with the first chord. It's just like this discord. Um, can't tell you which chord it is. But then it comes into this bright and cheery, almost Beatles-style chord sequence, you know, late-era Beatles um, song. It's one of the most conventional songs that Nirvana did, in a way. And Serve the Servants is a, is a very bitter um, song. I mean, essentially, it's, a, it's the, the stuff that people never tell you about being famous, really, that song. Um, I think there's, you know, certainly in this celebrity-dominated um, age, we tend to think that, you know, the second you become famous, your life is one big party and you're walking into nightclubs and people are buying you drinks and giving you high fives and uh, trying to get off with you. And um, Serve the Servants really tells you that it's, it's actually not like that because the, the trouble with Nirvana becoming such a big band was that Nirvana and Kurt Cobain in particular were not equipped to deal with fame. You know, they were not Big Brother contestants. They were not you know, pop idol wannabes. Uh, they were, you know, relatively damaged people before they even go into fame uh, and fortune. And the trouble with those things, if you're not a particularly well-adjusted person in the first place, they tend to amplify everything that's, that's wrong with your life. And that's really what Serve the Servants is about. Um, there's references to the way Courtney Love was treated in there. Uh, I think in the, you know, the reference to witch trials that you get in there. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very bitter record probably should be played to everybody who's thinking about starting a rock band um, before they actually sign that contract because that, that is potentially what you're getting into. The next song on the album, Scentless Apprentice, clearly demonstrates the record's characteristically heavier sound. Rarely do you hear a song burst out of speakers like that. It's full of vibrancy, so alive it's almost dead.
Scentless Apprentice is one of very few Nirvana songs credited to all three of them. Um, there was very, very little direct collaboration that went on. It was, it was very much Kurt Cobain plus two in terms of the songwriting usually. Um, weirdly though, it sounds like it could easily have been another Kurt Cobain song. It's a recognisably Nirvana song. Uh, and again, it's, it establishes another one of the themes of In Utero, which is a, 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 lyrically a, a fixation with childhood and with infanthood uh, and with uh, the bodily functions relating to reproduction. Lyrically on that one, the, the way Cobain's screaming, go away at the top of his voice, he's, this is the sound of complete alienation. This really is. I mean, when William Burroughs heard the record after Cobain's suicide, he read the lyrics and just said, this is a man, this man was already dead, you know, when he wrote In Utero. And you hear that and you just think, that's, that's fine. That sounds like someone tearing their own intestines out through the back of their throat. That's exactly what I want to hear. Um, and unusually for a Nirvana song. I think it had a literary inspiration. Lyrically, Cobain was inspired to write Scentless, Impre Scentless Apprentice after reading Patrick Susskind's Perfume novel from the mid-80s, I think, which embodied two of his great themes, which was the body and um, misan you know, misanthropic view of the world as well. One thing that people forget about Nirvana as well is the drumming talents of uh, Dave Grohl, because a lot of rock bands flounder, I think, personally think, because of just having a very humdrum, humdrum drummer. But Grohl is not just powerful, he's so inventive as well, and that kind of gets lost when in all the Nirvana myth and everything's wrapped up with Cobain. In the history of rock drummers, there are a handful of drummers that really stand out just simply by their sheer power. And that would be John Bonham, Keith Moon, and I would put Dave Grohl in, in a very similar um, league with those guys. There are a lot of other great rock drummers um, but many of them are finesse drummers or drummers that can play a variety of different styles and beats at the same time. Dave is simply a very powerful drummer. The Jack and Dino demoed song Rape Me also appears on In Utero, as well as being released as a double A-side single along with All Apologies. It is possibly the most outright pretty melody on the album and yet is wed to a tune called Rape Me, therefore pretty much ensuring it's never going to get played on the radio. up theme from Nevermind in the song Polly which was written about a someone who was going to be a rape victim who kind of turned it round on her uh, attacker and kind of used the power that Nirvana were beginning to have to try and say something quite radical. Polly wants a cracker I think I should get off the first I think she wants water to put out the blowtorch Cause I may have a seat In the clear, dirty wings And Rape Me is in a way a, an extension of that song and it's, it's kind of making a, a dubious equation between the fact that Kurt wanted to kind of write a song that would help people in that situation but ended up almost inevitably being identified with the aggressive power that would have attacked them. And so it's kind of him almost putting him, laying himself bare and saying, you know, just do this to me, this terrible thing. Whatever the song's intended meaning, on its release it was interpreted by fans and critics alike as a comment on the media and Cobain's own fame. Given the mood that Kurt Cobain was very obviously in regarding media intrusion and press intrusion and the fact that his personal life had turned into something of a soap opera, um, it's very difficult, as he would surely have known, for it not to be heard um, as a slightly self-indulgent protest song. The point with Rape Me was, he may not have meant it that way, but once he was where he was, it sounded like that. And that restriction was something that he's sort of, he was trying to cope with 
and also refusing to cope within, within utero, with, in utero. It was kind of saying, you know, I'm going to say this thing which matters to me, whatever, however it's going to be interpreted, and irrespective of our success, because that's what I've got to do, because otherwise I'm going to go mad. As the blackbird in the spring The next song on In Utero took its inspiration from Frances Farmer, a Seattle-born actress from Hollywood's golden age. Well, Frances Farmer will have a revenge on Seattle, a catchy title, um, is about is a, a, an actress called Frances Farmer who sort of was big in the first half of the 20th century, or very briefly, and due to a certain amount of willful official misapprehension of her strange behaviour, ended up being uh, incarcerated in a mental asylum uh, and given electroshock treatment, fairly severe drug therapy, and according to popular but I suspect unfounded rumour, a frontal lobotomy. She was a very troubled woman, um, alcoholic, um, very much like Cobain. I mean, Kurt identified with Frances Farmer dramatically, and Courtney did as well. I think Courtney married got married in Francis Farmer's old dress, or that was the rumour anyway. Um, so, and the Seattle connection as well. I mean, it was just a perfect icon that they could have for themselves, you know, whereas other people, Patti Smith had Hendrix and Jim Morrison, you know, people had these familiar ones. This was someone quite different and esoteric. <laughs> Yes, I'm relieving, but now that you're leaving, so that you can pay. Yes, I'm relaxing, but hear that you're resting, never you get to me. But it's a, it's a song in sort of... Um... I guess solidarity with a creative, willful and slightly misunderstood person who was fabulously, you know, badly treated and punished for being who she was. Uh, it's possible that Cobain saw elements of himself in that. I think it's equally possible that he saw something of the way that Courtney Love was beginning to be regard popularly regarded uh, in Francis Farmer's story at that point and was and wrote the song for his his wife there are obvious parallels between the persecution of Francis Farmer and the persecution of Kurt and Courtney and particularly Courtney who was kind of depicted as this witch who got him into hard drugs when they first met which was patently not true I think Kurt was already a, a using heroin before they met and in fact I think he encouraged her to, to use it uh, as it turns out um, but they were aware of that but also in the song, of course, there's this, I miss the comfort of being sad. That's such a great Cobain line, you know, this man who kind of reveled in melancholia in a way. That was his attitude towards life. It was never good enough. Another song on the album that demonstrates Cobain's lyrical depression is Dumb. Dumb is essentially a very sweet song and a very, very, very never mind sounding song. It, it, it has that weird skipping rhythm of a lot of Kurt Cobain's songs. He kind of comes to terms with how much the idea of being happy upsets him, which is, you know, a fascinating idea, especially for someone who's been subsequently depicted as wallowing in his own misery. And it's like there's, there are a couple of songs in the sound which are really shot through with have a real sense of joy. But it is still a very, very pretty tune and, and a, a, a timely reminder in the context of the album of um, what a fantastic knack for writing pop songs he had.
Several songs on the LP's second side begin to show the anti-commercial edge to the record and the influence of Steve Albini. For me, it's one of the last sort of big albums that I remember experiencing on vinyl and not thinking that it was meant to be experienced any other way or anyone else would be experiencing it any other way, even though that was probably wrong because probably lots of people were getting it on CD. But it's very much an album of two, sort of a classic vinyl album of two sides. And on the second side, you start to see why possibly two weeks isn't quite long enough to record a great album. Again, it, it, it is part of the very... Uh, aggressive nature of the album that taken as a whole most of the more obvious and accessible songs tend to be front-loaded near the start of the record so you get kind of an easy introduction the longer you listen to the album that the, the harder um, it starts to get <laughs> got something about them and that you know they all have their place on the album but they're equally songs which might have been abandoned if he'd had a bit longer to come up with something else you know and that they do they, they do give the album that kind of scratchy feel um, they wanted to do a harder edged you know sound they I don't think they necessarily wanted to alienate their audience but they definitely wanted their peers to think of them as still being punks and in utero has a very punk sound these songs, among others on the record, also demonstrate the depth and power of Cobain's vocal talents. Kurt's singing voice, I, I always really liked. I, I thought he had a, he sounded always really so uh, sincere. I liked the pure honesty, and I think that's what really uh, grabbed me the most. He had such just raw, you know, raw honesty. You know, he had this weird upside down, un, upside down way of playing guitar. He played guitar left-handed even though he was right-handed. He wrote great songs with good hooks, but really his voice was, has, has, was always the strongest thing that really grabbed people and pulled you into the band. And it was the expressiveness of his voice that really sets him apart. One of the centerpieces of the second side of the album is the song Penny Royal T. It's just a beautiful song, beautiful and painful, and you know that from um, one of the greatest moments in 90s rock music is really when that chorus kicks in. It's just, it's as rousing as a football anthem, but with you know everything that a football anthem doesn't have. refers to a herb which is used as an abortive and the, there were long sections in interviews of Kurt saying you know you have to drink I know girls that have used it you, to, 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 to try and have an abortion you have to drink lots of it it doesn't really work you know and he was really interested in the properties of particular chemicals in the way that you know a junkie will be. The lyrics there are very much concerned with pain, abortion, bodily functions, bodily fluids and remedies. There's the cherry flavoured antacid in the song. It's like the song, the song's almost like a, it's like an ingredients list on some incredibly dubious piece of medication you wish you hadn't got from the chemist. Among the final songs on the record is Radio Friendly Unit Shifter, a song that clearly demonstrates Nirvana's hostility to some aspects of the music industry. Radio Friendly Unit Shifter, it is, it is all there in the title. It was, it was a very much a Nirvana thing and very much a Seattle grunge thing, the slightly laboured sarcasm towards uh, all vestiges of the music business. And obviously when you look at the song by Nirvana called Radio Friendly Unit Shifter, you know it's going to sound like somebody ticket kicking a tool case down a stair stairwell. And that is um, 
That's pretty much what it does. It's 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 a. I mean, it, it's quite thrilling in a way. It's a it's a fairly uh, um, exuberant and invigorating oral assault. I'm not really sure how often you'd want to go out of your way to listen to it in one lifetime. <laughs> that uh, Kurt Cobain heard an awful lot, probably during the Nevermind period. Um, it's one of those phases that American music biz execs like to bandy around, uh, or certainly did like to bandy around in the 90s. Um, and here we're seeing you know, Kurt's famous uh, sense of irony at play because of all the tracks on In Utero, uh, if any one of them is not a radio-friendly unit shifter, obviously it's that one. Um, so I think, you know, it's easy to see in Utro as just a dark record, and it is a dark record, and the benefit of hindsight has made it seem even darker than it did at the time. But still in there, there are, there are moments of that Cobain humour, which I think rescues it from being a, a purely uh, depressing record. Yeah, radio-friendly unit shifter. I mean, it's a, it's a great title, and it's a great example of Cobain at his cynical best. And it's really a one-riff, one-line song. It's, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? And... Um, yeah, that's a genuine question that he's ask, asking in that song. The album climaxes with a song that since Cobain's tragic death has been imbued with a lot more poignancy. It, it's impossible not to listen to all apologies as, a, 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 as almost him signing off. Um, it's not properly the last track on the album because there is, of course, the bizarre quantity of silence followed by the... Sturm and Drang of the, the secret one at the end. Um, it's, it's just impossible to know whether he was already harbouring serious thoughts of suicide when he wrote the song, and that doesn't seem impossible given that that had already appeared as an idea in, in other of, others of his lyrics. Um, it's just, uh, he was clearly, uh, at the time this album was recorded and, and subsequently a, a very confused and unhappy person, um, but I think that the strength of the strength of that song and the strength of the whole album is that you don't really you don't need to know that the guy killed himself afterwards to actually sort of think this is this is a great and significant record. It's a sort of, it's a golden oldie, it's a suicide song, it sums up this uh, experience which has been taken away from everyone, including Kurt, and made into a cliché. And um, before all that happened, this song was a beautiful living, it, just an exquisite thing. And in some ways, you know, that's very, very sad in itself, and that, that almost... In that, in that change, you can see kind of what's happened to Nirvana and what both what Cobain's suicide did to the band and kind of cutting them off and leaving them there and making everything be something that would be picked over and digested and endlessly sort of made dull in the way that has happened. But also it, it sort of embodied why he committed suicide because, you know, there's just this yearning in it to communicate and just to sort of say, you know, what else can I say? Everyone is gay. It's just like almost regressing to childhood in the desire to make an impact on people in a way which is genuine and isn't just about the fact that this is a song being sung by a hugely successful band. In the sun, in the sun. There are 
clear signs that he suffered from depression most of his life and sadly was never really properly treated for that. But I don't know that he ever enjoyed life. I mean, I think there is a pall of depression that hangs over most of Kurt's life. And it's that sense that it wasn't to be that you're reminded of every time you hear it. You know, now, you know, it's a song that I now find almost unbearable to listen to because it's so, you know, it's sort of so beautiful, but also so lost. On its release, In Utero went straight to the top of the Billboard charts. To this day, it remains many critics' favourite Nirvana album. As a whole, even uh, 13 years later, which is an absolute eternity uh, in, in popular music terms, it stands up astonishingly well. Um, it hasn't dated at all, uh, which I think says a lot about the virtues of Steve Albini's very fundamentalist approach to making records. This is absolutely fabulous. From a, ba from a band that's got the world in its hands, and to make an album that is so raw, that says so much, that cuts so deep, and that is just so full of sh strength and vulnerability, wonderful songwriting, incredible power. Um, you know, it's just, it really stands up in the pantheon of classic rock albums. Despite its chart success, it quickly became clear that the more uncommercial elements on the record had succeeded in alienating some of Nirvana's fan base. It was the trial by fire for the fans. Either you were willing to, to listen and accept or at least wonder about what this band was thinking and why are they doing this, or you were totally put off by it and just said, eh, that's terrible, I'm, I'm sticking with Nevermind and I don't want to hear anything this band ever does again. It's certainly not as a, their most immediately accessible record. That will obviously always be Nevermind, but I think, weirdly, it may be the one that does end up lasting and, and be the one that people do still keep coming back to in, in, in 20, 30 years from now. In Utero sits there on its own like this kind of gleaming beautiful thing and I think the great thing about it in a way is it wasn't an influential record at all because it just was what it was and no one else was no one else could follow it or no one else could try and do anything else like it. Weirdly if you're going to think of something that In Utero had influenced I think you'd have to look at completely different kinds of music. I think probably probably the Palace Brothers, Bonnie, Prince, Billy, you know, that kind of, that very sort of dark strain of all country. Of all country. Oh, no, I see your darkness. 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 Did you know how much I love you? Hope that somehow you, you can save me from this darkness. That basically was a response to Nirvana's success because there was not anyone with any creative now to realise that you couldn't do any more in that field, so you had to try and do something else. And all those people, the kind of, the, you know, the, the, well, they tend to be called the old country people, but, but Will Eldham, I think, is the, the greatest example of a songwriter who he is definitively post. Kurt Cobain, because Cobain has done this stuff, Will Oldham had to do something else. And I think that's where the lineage kind of goes that way. And it starts, but that comes kind of after Nirvana with the use of the Lead Belly song, Where Did You Sleep Last Night? That kind of kick-started in some ways that whole thing, I think. In, in utero, in, in terms of its influence, it, it, it is best thought of as a component of Nirvana's influence as, as a whole, which was absolutely colossal, not just musically, but in terms of the way they went about it. But it's almost more an attitude. It's like if you're a serious band, at some point you've got to get around to making your in utero. Um, you've got to make that record which is uncompromising in its sound, which is uncompromising in its lyrics. And uh, I think, you know, you can see elements of, of that in uh, all sorts of records. You know, when, when Radiohead made Kid A, when people wanted them to make a, a record that made them into U2, uh, they in fact, you know, went the other way, and uh, you know, they made it's not as it's not as scary as in Utero, it's not as bleak as in Utero, but they made a record which was essentially saying to everyone who thinks we're the U new U2, we're not, you know, we're just going to do what we want to do, and I think that's its key influence. That it really gave bands permission to do that. Huge big bands who perhaps are under pressure from record companies say you've got to follow up your last mega selling album with more of the same, you know, this album's got to be even bigger, it's got to have even you know, bigger hits on it. I think uh, what Neutro does was that bands could think, well, actually, we don't have to do that. 
you know, we can, we can step back, we can try and do something different. So art artistically, I think it's, it's been a very influential record. <laughs> Cobain's suicide in 1994 sparked a whole new brand of Nirvana obsession, and over time, In Utero, as his final studio album, has become seen as Kurt Cobain's swan song. There's a lot of flirtation with the dark side in, in pop music, and um, but you know, unfortunately, on In Utero, it was kind of the real thing. Within months, he was trying to kill himself, and just over a year later, he was dead by his own hand. Um, which just reinforces the sense of genuine sense of real pain that's etched throughout that record. Despite his tragic death, In Utero, along with Nirvana's other recorded work, stands as a testament to Cobain's talents as a songwriter. He was able to put huge emotional shifts within his songs. So when we listen to them, it kind of is a, a it helps us in our own lives either understand ourselves or express and feel our emotions more. And, you know, when I look at why his legacy has been so strong now, more than 10 years after his death, I, I ascribe it to that, that he wrote really, really powerful songs that have had a tremendously lasting impact on so many people that listen to them.